All right, so let's, uh, we're gonna convene the meeting at this point in time. Welcome to the San Lorenzo Valley Board of Directors meeting for September 17th, 2020. Holly, would you please call the roll? Director Moran. Present. Director Henry. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Ferris. Present. President Swan. Here. Thank you, Holly. Uh, so let's see, do we have any uh, additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Um, staff has none, I, I don't know about district council. Uh, yeah, uh, none, none from me. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, oh, hold on a second. Before we uh, go any further, we have a staff member who's in closed session. This isn't closed session yet. We still have to have oral communication. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, so next up is oral communication regarding the items on the closed session agenda. Do we have any uh, any comments, communications about anything on the uh, closed session agenda? <coughs> Attendees, no hands are up. So I'm assuming that both Cynthia and Joe don't have any questions about the closed session agenda. Okay, so that being the case, we're going to now adjourn to the closed session. And then we will rejoin you when we've con concluded. So we are- um, Sorry, with you. We are live on the meeting now. We are, uh, we are convening to open session at what on my Mickey Mouse watch says is something past 6.30. Uh, and so uh, are all the directors back on? That's my question. Would you like me to call roll? Yeah, let's do that because I don't see everybody on this and uh, CTV has got a weird thing going on here. Director Moran? Present. Director Henry? Here. Director Falls? Here. Director Ferris? Present. And President Swan? Here, thank you, Holly, appreciate it. Okay, so we're uh, we convened back to open session and we have nothing to report out of closed session. So moving into the open session agenda, uh, Rick, are there any additions or deletions to the open session agenda? Rick, you're muted. Excuse me, Chair Swan, I have no uh, additions or deletions to the agenda. Okay, thank you, Rick. Uh, at this time, then uh, we will entertain oral communications from any of the um, public that's called in and uh, you can comment on any subject uh, you wish to, that's not on the agenda. So I can't see, there we go. We've got, it uh, looks like we've got 10 attendees. Do we have any questions or anything, any comments from anybody on any items not on the agenda tonight? Does not look like it. Okay, moving back to the panel. All right, so moving on to uh, Rick, take us into item eight, unfinished business. Lead thank you, uh, thank you, Chair Swan. Item eight uh, is a CZU wildfire operational update. This will be an oral update. Uh, we did not get our final engineering reports in, in time for the agenda, but I will give you an, an, uh, an update. I am pleased to tell the board as of today, uh, we have zero customers uh, out of water. Um, staff has worked continuously since the fire to get all of our customers back in water. And as of today, we have zero customers out of water. And we have about approximately, I think, 462 connections with a do not drink, do not boil notice. We have uh, one area 
uh, that we have detected benzene in, and that is the Riverside Grove area, uh, North Boulder Creek. Uh, and ongoing sampling and flushing uh, appears that we are minimizing uh, that contamination, uh, but much more sampling will be needed in that general area. And I do believe that affects 62 customers, if I have my zones correct in front of me. Uh, since we met last time, um, we have found additional damage. We had a registered professional forester come in and assess the trees uh, and vegetation around the district's lion water treatment facility, which encompasses the, the treatment plant, lion tank, little lion tank, and big steel. A significant amount of trees were, were deemed necessary to remove due to either trunk or root damage. Um, there is fire underground that is burning roots, and then there are some trunk damage that required a considerable amount of more trees to remove. These trees were all in reach of either the treatment plant, lion tank uh, facilities, or uh, a danger to staff uh, in replacing um, facilities uh, in that area. It was also found on Sunday afternoon as staff was getting ready to bring another significant amount of connections in water uh, inspection of the two tanks, the Lion tree, or the Lion water tank, uh, which is a 3 million gallon tank, and the Little Lion water tank, which is, I do believe, a 250,000 gallon water tank, had contamination, had uh, VOC contamination. The piping from those tanks burned, and the piping acted as a chimney, and uh, a draft was pulled all of the exhaust from the burning HDPE pipe up into the tanks, coating the complete insides of the two tanks contaminated with VOCs. Um, this was uh, a discovery that most likely will require recoating the interior of these tanks. We have an engineering firm sampling and evaluating our coatings inside, but it appears that these two tanks will have to be recoated. Uh, this will increase uh, our damage by close to three quarters of a million dollars to a million dollars as this is hazmat and uh, coatings are quite expensive and time consuming to replace. So with the uh, contamination found in those tanks, additional portable storage had to be brought in uh, to put the zone back in water. So staff brought in, I do believe three 10,000 gallon tanks uh, put in place. Uh, we, we put one in Sunday night to get the zone back in water. And then they have installed, or they are installing the other two tanks to get up to uh, 30,000 uh, 30, gallons. With the discovery of the VOC damage inside the tanks, it was also discovered that, that the overflow piping and additional piping uh, was contaminated that will be required to be replaced. We are moving forward on temporary uh, repairs. Um, uh, on the Foreman Creek supply line, which is in that general area. And we have ran a considerable amount of above ground piping uh, to put customers back in water while we are replacing um, piping between the, the three reservoirs. Uh, a considerable amount more of, of funds need to be expend, expended for tree removal. Um, we are putting estimates together to bring back to the board for uh, amendment to construction contracts. Uh, we are approaching most likely the $1.3 million uh, in, in repairs to date. Uh, we'll bring back contract amendments to the board uh, at the next meeting. With that, I'll ask if uh, the director of operations wants to add anything to the update uh, on the getting the system back in the fire. I mean, James, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so I'd let you go on with that. So we did not get that one customer on Madrone Drive back in water today. We, oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't report that back to you. They were making that connection. And when they made that connection, that house did not come back in water this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be right back on that house tomorrow morning, figuring out how to hook them up. And then we are, mm -hmm. We do have 15,000 gallons of storage at the Little Lion place, right? 
uh, tank right now. We have tanks being delivered tomorrow, and we will be up to about 35 to 40,000 gallons on that site with temporary storage tomorrow. And we are moving ahead with testing, swap testing the lion tanks, and then cleaning and probably going to recoat the inside of those tanks. We do have da uh, damage to the tanks, plus the tanks are due at this time for this, and they're empty at this point. So we really think it's a good time to get in there and get it done either way with the whole thing. But with the testing, we do believe it's going to come back VOCs in the paint, and we have an engineer on, on contract that's been out there and has pretty much told us, and they're getting us a letter saying that there is contamination to the coatings. So hopefully everything goes pretty smooth on that. And that's about all I got. I'd just like to add too, on the coatings of the tank, we are putting together a, uh, a proposal to put out a request for proposal. There will be a short bidding process for repairs, uh, replacement of, of those uh, coatings. Uh, and we'll bring that back to the board uh, for approval. It is a high dollar item. It'll be close to a million dollars for both of those tanks with uh, hazmat disposal uh, of the interior. But we are going through a bidding process for uh, uh, for that replacement. Uh, a lot of that, just uh, I know this, uh, our board is uh, always wants to, to see us uh, hire locally. A lot of our temporary crews and contractors are local in the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, and uh, they're working very hard and it's been a, a great relationship moving ahead with a lot of the local contractors. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to the board. I know it's not a written report. We just ran out of time. I'll uh, go back to the board for questions or yeah, comments. Rick. Yep, thanks, Rick. Uh, on, the, on the tanks where the VOCs were detected, what was the capacity, storage capacity that's impacted by those tanks? Those two tanks? Uh, the big a lion tank is three million gallons. Little lion is like two hundred and fifty thousand gallons. It's close to forty five percent of the district total storage. It's pretty important. Um, it definitely has uh, impacted the district on on fire flow right now, um, and it's going to be a problem as we go into the winter months um, with opera be operational problems. So we're going to want to move on getting those two tanks recoded to get them back online as soon as possible. Uh, those two tanks are also part of the treatment plant process. Right. And, and what would the, the and, time take to recoat the, those two tanks? Um, so that should be, once we get the spec together that Sandus Engineering, the contract engineer right now that we're working with, they're putting the spec together. It's probably going to take them about a week to put that together. Once they get into coatings, we're figuring at least four to five weeks. But... At this point, we have no surface water. Our surface water intakes are taken out. Our surface water piping's all taken out. We have a very sensitive debris flow that's probably gonna come off of these mountains um, come winter time. We are moving ahead with putting the foreman piping in and all that, but we're really worried about this debris flow and what is gonna actually happen before the rains hit us this year. And so we're not too sure when we're going to be able to fire this treatment plant back up and actually get into those tanks. So our timeline for recoding, I feel, is we got the time right now. We have the time, but we're going to move on it very, very quickly. Right. One of the big keys is going to be finding, you know, a, a tank coder that's availability, and we will go out and and beat the bush to try to get somebody to uh, respond very quickly. We want to get these tanks coated. Even so we don't have surface water, we can pump up well water uh, to start getting some storage back. We need to, to get some storage back. Um, so we'll, if need be, we'll move well water up to those tanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Bob, you have uh, your hand up? Bob Fultz? Yes, thanks. And James, thanks to you and your team for, you know, staying on, on this so diligently. It's greatly appreciated. I, see a lot of comments on social media about how uh, appreciative people are for that. And so thank you for, for doing that. Um, relative to the repair and coating of these tanks, 
um, how much of this could be covered by FEMA versus how much would be need to be covered by us? Well, one of the big things with that is the testing of these tanks and testing of everything. So proven damage is what has to happen. And that's why testing of everything is very important right now. Are the are the repairs that need to be done this also caused by, I don't know, trees hitting it or fire damage or something like that? Or are the repairs that need to be done sort of the normal thing you do on a tank that's old and, and, and needs to be maintained in this fashion? So none of the tanks were damaged by falling trees or anything like that. Our damage is from piping, piping, chimneying the VO, well, I can't even say VOCs at this point, we haven't tested them, but they piped and chimneyed the soot and black residue into these tanks, and they are just fully covered in this black residue. Yeah. So now the you, testing is to begin. You, you mentioned that there were repairs, I think Rick, Rick mentioned there were repairs that need to be done. Are those repairs different than just recoating the tank? Um, yes, we need to replace the piping going up to the tanks because the, oh, okay. the piping But it's not a repair, it's not a repair on the tank itself. Not a repair on the tank itself. Oh, okay, no, sorry, I misunderstood. On, on, uh, on, the, on the recoating, there, there's two, there's two uh, approaches on this. There's, there's the FEMA approach, which we feel pretty comfortable that we will have coverage but the district has also, uh, district council and myself has also had an extensive meeting with our uh, SDRMA, our risk manager, and the district does have pollution and contamination coverage that most likely where one lifts off, the other one will pick up. We haven't uh, drilled down to the, the total coverage yet and, and with SDRMA, but we do have pollution and contamination coverage. Okay, well, of course, but I, I'm just getting a sense here of what we've got to cover this outside of our own reserves. Right. So thank you, thank you for that clarification. Uh, hey, Lois, you had your hand up next? Yes. So, James, um, do you blast the inside of the tank to take off the coating and all the junk that's got on it? Is, is that how you get rid of it? The first thing that'll happen from what I understand talking with the hazmat team that's getting ready to come in next week at some point after we get our swab testing from our engineering group. First thing I understand they're going to do is they're going to pressure wash the whole thing to get rid of the hazmat of the of this soot and black grime that has collected in the tank. And then from there you what I understand is they'll sandblast everything, encapsulate and sandblast everything, capture everything, do a vacuum out and a clean out, and then they'll recoat the inside of the tank. Okay, and as for the debris coming down um, and affecting surface water, um, does anybody, I, I, I mean, I've heard we're gonna have a dry year, then I've heard we're gonna have a wet year and nobody knows. But this definitely affects um, Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency and things we're talking about. And do you think it'll be at least a year before all of that stuff gets washed away or what? Because we're going to be using groundwater and we're going to reduce uh, the level of our groundwater. I have no timeline on how long that would take to, for that to happen. It's going to be a wait and see approach. And we hope that as soon as the heavy rains are over, it's the County of Santa Cruz will take the lead on debris flows uh, from the watershed. And as soon as the heavy rains are over early spring, we'll have Foreman Creek uh, back online and Foreman Creek can put out a significant amount of water um, in, from past uh, winters we know. And our plan is to get Foreman Creek online as soon as the, the heavy rains subside and we can get in there. You know, the first rains are gonna have a lot of debris and pretty much we'll let that go by. We will be using the Fall Creek intake because Felton's only source of water uh, in their system uh, is surface water. Uh, we can pump water, uh, well water up to Fall Creek uh, through the inner ties. Um, but if it gets really critical 
you know, we can always uh, rely on the well field heavily and we can always go into a, a stricter conservation to get through those real heavy winter months. So the, so the restrictions on Felton water, is this considered an emergency that lifts some of those restrictions? I'm sorry, Lo, say that again. Well, we are, I mean, Felton, we aren't supposed to be using their water at certain times. So does this, is this an emergency that lifts those restrictions? Yes, this is a federally declared emergency and this is emergency mode for the district. We are more than fully allowed to use that emergency inner tie at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, James and Rick. Thank you, Lewis. Lou, you're uh, next up. Rick, I have a question for you. You mentioned the harvesting of fire damaged trees. Are we looking at trying to convert some of those fire damaged trees into board feet and do some cost recovery there? Yes. Any idea yes, on the magnitude? I do not. We're still, uh, we do have a forester and James that are working with the local mills to discuss uh, uh, possibly selling that timber the down timber that we have stacked at one of our storage yards right now. But yes, that's your question, yes. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, no other, I don't see any other hands from the board. How about, uh, look, can I say something, Rick? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, please, thank you. Go right ahead. Um, so um, is that tree removal is gonna happen up around Lions Tank? That's what I'm understanding. It's happening around Lion Plant, Big Steel Tank, Lion Little Lion Tank, and the um, trail and access into form an intake from the plant to form an intake. Okay, so my question is, is this going to change, so all the tree removal, is it going to change the analysis of the lion slide? I'll let Carly take that one. Yeah. We just met with the environmental people we did we just had rincon come down um, they're going to bring in that information into their feasibility analysis um, so that'll be in the reports that we bring to the agencies um, the vegetation in that area wasn't as significantly um, damaged as rest of the upper areas of the treatment plant so um, they are addressing that right now in the feasibility okay great thank you thank you and we will be looking at that whole site for access. Now, now that whole site has changed. Before with this slide, it was a heavily wooded site. Um, there wasn't really any act, any other access that we could see or our geotech could see. We'll revisit that again to see if there is another access in now that we've changed that whole, the whole lay of the land up there. Great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Bob, you have your hand up again. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, James, I understand the, the, the lion plant is currently offline, right? It's not treating any water? Correct. Is there any impacts to bringing that back up once it's been offline for a while? Because it sounds like it's going to be offline for a little bit. Well, I mean, there could be, but at this time, we do have all of our filters soaked with water that when we turned it off. We left water in the filters to keep the nylon beads and the sand and the anthracite and everything wet. Um, we may need to at some point change that water out from stagnation. We don't yep. want it to get too old in there, that's for sure. Yep. But um, we're definitely, we definitely, we went in, we closed the plant down to the tightest as we could. We took all chemicals out. We drained all chemical lines. We took the tubings, made sure all the tubings were drained. So it's put to bed in a very clean way right now. Is the one thing that might have to happen though is changing out the water in those filters to keep the, that water on that media fresh. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, uh, James, were, were there any animal rights people that came in and cleaned your fish tank? <laughs> yeah, never mind. It's much better than the last time I saw you know, James, uh, you can no, hit him now. I agree. <laughs> um, one, one last thing before you turn it over to the pu public for comment is that we are still uh, supplying bottled water at our operations uh, facility in downtown Boulder Creek. 
Um, that the majority of that water, if not all of it, is being donated by many different agencies and uh, and vendors such as Budweiser and, and so forth, et cetera. And we are supplying water through a five gallon um, filling station for refillable bottles. And we just heard today that Red Cross is donating 500 more five gallon bottles uh, and 25 more um, pallets of bottled water. And we are supplying water for folks up in the Big Basin Water District, Bracken Bray, any of the areas around that do not have potable water. And uh, Steve, can I add to that? Certainly. <clears throat> Go ahead, Lou. Uh, so uh, Lou and I participated in that, uh, giving people water and filling up their uh, bottles. And um, in the history of our culture, we often met at the watering hole and uh, tales were told and uh, people shared their life. And that's really what happened in just three hours that I was there. The people that uh, got water, came for water, were so appreciative of what the water district was doing and the people were doing to help them. And um, it was uh, heartening to see the response that people had, and in their grief, uh, they're all without water. And um, so it, it was really nice to see that community spirit about what was going on there. And it's really successful and appreciative of what the water district is doing about giving out free water and making it easy for them in this hard time. That's great to hear. Thank you, Rick, for sharing that. Uh, okay, let's go to any of the public comments, right? So we've got uh, the public has an opportunity now to comment on anything that we've just been discussing. And I see uh, Larry Ford, you are recognized. Feel free to share your thoughts and comments. You're on Dude. mute. There you go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. I I have two questions. Um, I'm concerned about the the possibility of wintertime flooding, mud flows, landslides, and debris flows. And I'm wondering whether there's been any kind of preliminary assessment of, of where those risks are. And uh, you, you said that the county was gonna take the lead on that. I know that um, USGS has considerable capability for doing that kind of an assessment. And I think CAL FIRE does some related assessments. If, if I could answer that, uh, Chair Swan. Yes, um, the, the County of Santa Cruz is uh, taking the lead agency with CAL FIRE. There are many high level meetings. Uh, um, our staff spent several hours today in discussion. Uh, the Director of Operations has been out on the watershed with county uh, watershed folks and uh, public works folks. The county is extremely concerned about debris flows on all of the streams. And there is a USGA, USGS report out uh, that kind of outlines a lot of that. They're not saying potentially debris flows. They are saying debris flows will be coming. They are looking at additional evacuations along the streams. Um, and they are looking at a huge outreach program for people to be prepared uh, to leave their homes before winter storms. And they are installing a network of rain gauges and early warning devices to warn people. Uh, the county is taking this extremely serious and has thrown a lot of resources on it. They have many concerns about people repopulating in trailers, coming back into areas where there's no power no cell service, um, there's a lot being done. It's just in the beginning stages, but every agency in the county is working on this and including the water district. So there'll be a lot more to follow on uh, this winter. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate all the work that everybody's doing on this. Related to that, Rick, I'm. I'm worried about another fire. We still have two months to go in the fire season. Has have, have your fire management consultants done any kind of assessment of the risks, especially like on the you know the east side of the valley for 
another major uh, wildfire that could develop there? Well, I, maybe Carly can speak to that because I, I haven't been in, I have not been involved in any discussions uh, on that. Right. So Panorama has switched their gears um, to work on post fire with with us, uh, but they are still working on the entire management plan for the district. I'm um, considering the east side as well. Um, if there were to be other fires, we are still looking into hardening those areas. Um, and again, it just comes down to funding. And unfortunately, with everything else going on, um, there is just kind of this focus on the emergency response. But we are keeping an eye on that, and we will be doing some implementation here. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Larry. Uh, yes, we have uh, uh, Jesse Capen. You have an opportunity to share your thoughts. Hi, um, I just had a quick question uh, to follow up um, from the previous question. Um, Rick, you mentioned that uh, the, there is a report, um, and I don't know if you're referring to from USGS or from CAL FIRE, um, about the threat of debris flows. And I know CAL FIRE had a preliminary report out, but do you know if uh, either of those publications from CAL FIRE or from USGS are accessible to the public? You know, they are accessible, and I'll make sure we get them up on the website tomorrow. Okay. Um, if they're not already up, they may be. Carly, I'm not sure, but if not, I'll make sure they get up on our website tomorrow for people to, uh, to access. Right. We can post the USGS debris flows map, um, but the WART report from CAL FIRE won't be available to the public until uh, September 29th, is my understanding. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next, we have uh, uh, Gail. Go ahead. Go ahead, Gail. Gail, you're on mute. How about now? Now is good. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that previous question and uh, really encourage the district to put the USGS report um, on the uh, website and encourage all of our ratepayers to take a look at it. It's actually a very detailed report that allows you to look at every single watershed um, and the risk, whether it's uh, low, medium, of, or high, for the hazard for mud flows during uh, high intensity rain events. Um, and these were developed um, based on the degree to which areas were burned, the slopes, the soils that were there. And the good news for the district is that actually the hazards in a relative sense are for the most part low because our, uh, in most of our drainages, because the uh, watersheds are small. So the amount of debris that's there is not a lot. Um, but the Foreman Creek, drainage is one that actually has a moderate hazard. Um, and so people should really be aware of where their houses are with respect to downstream of the moderate uh, hazard areas on these maps. The, the other thing I'd like to say is that um, we know from previous fires um, in these kinds of settings that the effects of debris flows uh, in terms of recovery of the watersheds are on the order of one two to three years. So I, I think we, we can't hope that we'll be, at, um, I was going to say out of the woods, but that's not the right <laughs> thing to say, that, that, that things will be fine in after next spring. Um, I think that we can expect to have um, repeated debris flows, uh, obviously of smaller volume, that will continue for uh, at least another year and maybe two. And I guess one question I would ask is, are there ways to once we get the worst of this stuff off the, off the mountain, that we can construct things that catch some of that debris that, that will come down if you rebuild the Foreman Creek facilities. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that right? If we have not addressed that, and I don't think we will. We could talk with the county on that because the county is trying to to figure out how to keep you know debris from coming down to culverts, the, there's going to be a huge push for all of the culvert systems um, 
to try to keep them from plugging with these debris flows because there's already, you know, the, where James it took uh, the county, I think yesterday they showed pictures of already logs sliding down the hill uh, right into the stream into Harmon Creek. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not only just logs, all the root damage, the surface okay. root damage is horrible up there. And you're talking about slopes that are so steep you can barely walk on them at this point with the with the debris that are falling down sliding already with the dry slide due to the root damage up there carly as well has been taking us going out with us and she's been getting a group of people to go out with us from the county from environmental from our engineering group from geologists you know i mean the other day we went out i think <laughs> both people with us out there and the stuff we walked through is just it's mind-blowing how steep the terrain is yep. and what's actually going to come down out there and right now from what i mean being in these meetings with the county being in these meetings on the higher end their game plan is to save the culverts down at the highways there's not much they're going to be able to do before rainy season up on these terrains these terrains are very steep hard to get to there's not a lot you can do at this point Okay, uh, Gail, did you have any further uh, questions or comments? Uh, no, I, I, I don't really. I mean, it, what they're describing is kind of what I expected. And actually, in many ways, the greatest hazards are down in the low-lying areas below all the slopes. And um, in terms right. of sort of Santa... The uh, populated areas are the greatest yeah. concern. So, um, yeah, and so that that's that's actually that's actually from the standpoint of Santa Cruz, probably the greater concern. Um, I mean, for us, it's for the district, it's one thing, but there's also you know the potential for damage to homes, lives, and everything else. Like we had what 1982 when we had the floods. That yeah, and that's like the city of Santa Cruz is down there cutting vegetation and digging silt and everything out of the rip mouth of the river down there. And they're working up into town already, cutting vegetation, wow. cleaning silt out, because they know what's coming down there. And they already have an evacuation plan that's going on for the low-lying trailer park that's down there somewhere they were talking about. You know, I mean, it's it's definitely not a good scenario at this point. Well, it's very encouraging that they're already moving on that. That goes to show you that it, the, the degree that this could be, because it I don't think most people will realize that how serious this is. Um, there is a lot of down timber and damage in the watershed. Okay, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Gail. Uh, okay, next we have uh, Joe, Joe Cucciera. Feel free to ask a question or share a comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have a question. Um, at the last uh, online meeting, um, it was reported that there were 50 uh, of the 90 samples had come in. And I've been trying to check the site every day several times. And I'm not seeing, uh, to use an example, um, for example, in locations three, four, and five, um, the last samples were either like in, in location three was September 3rd, location four was September 4th, uh, location five was September 7th. Where, where are the remaining sample data showing? I know you've, when you've been making changes in lifting the unsafe water order, you've been posting, uh, as best as I can see, you've been posting the data related to where you've been lifting, but I'm not seeing where the rest of the data is being posted. Maybe someone could say where that no, is. I don't think that has been posted yet. And correct me if I'm wrong, James, our meeting would stay today. We were posting tomorrow. Nate said that we haven't got that, that, that last sample results that we've got back. We haven't got posted yet. Um, oh. Again, it takes a week after we take the sample to get all the information back and get it to be posted. But usually, Joe, as soon as we get it, 
an approval from the state after they review, we get it posted. So I, I uh, be patient and it's gotta be coming out very shortly. The full yeah, report, was, was the full re the Joe, can you give me a second? Yeah, the I was full report is being compiled and we're getting all the data points in there. Right now, the stuff that's been being posted is for lifting and for being able to get these neighborhoods back in water and get them off the DND, DMB. And all the other data points are being put together and we aren't approved for, from the state yet to release those. And that's in review by the state now. And it should follow a map. Uh, we're trying to get a better mapping of each individual sample. We're working on updating new mapping to try to get more information out because we do know that people want to see in the distribution system where these samples are being collected. Uh, when, we had quite the discussion today with the state on updating uh, public information. Because well, I was referring to at, at the last meeting or the last online session anyway, um, you said that you had posted the 50 of the 90 you had done and then you were continuing to do more sampling. And so I said that was back on September 9th. So I was, I thought you you would have the remainder of those by now, right? I'll, I'll double check with, with our water quality staff uh, first thing in the morning and I'll email you when that's going to be out. Okay. I don't really and have then, that information right off the top of my head. And the, the summary table that you did for September 9th is really helpful. Do you think when you're doing your, your data entry, you can, it's oftentimes pretty common to show what the MCL levels are for each of the mm -hmm. various tests you're doing. And those are not showing up in any of your tables. Okay. The, either the MCLs or what the action level is. Sometimes gotcha. they're referred to as MCL. Sometimes they're referred, right. they're referred to as action levels. Okay. Good points. I'll, I'll talk with Nate in the morning and that, that would be great, Rick. See if we can make some updates. And I'll, I got your email address and we'll get back to you on, uh, uh, on the other sample results when we're going to have posted. Then as I understood both the first Zoom meeting and then the emergency meeting, I had understood from both your comments and some of the others that, that a lot of the system didn't lose pressure, specifically when I asked about Brookdale. But the, so is that correct? That's correct. I, I you know, at you, where you live in Brookdale did not lose pressure. It okay, was on the other side of the main pump, which is just outside of Brookdale into Boulder Creek that we started to have uh, pressure issues. There was definitely pressure breaks on the west side of Highway 9 in right. a couple in one little zone, which is south zone. And then on the Alta Via Road, there was a pressure where the main line was burned up, but there was pressure to where it burned up to when we turned off those valves at the burning Hi. The, the the reason I asked for clarification because this might help you when you go to your to on your main website your SLVWD website and you go to the CZU fire water quality info page there's a background introductory there's two paragraphs in the first paragraph the the second to the last sentence says that the depressurized, I'm reading it to you, says the depressurized zones included all SLVWD services north of Alba Road and the Highway 9 intersection. So that says that everything was depressurized north of Alba Road, which would include not just where I live, but everything before Brookdale and after. That is definitely needs to be corrected. That's bad information. Because that that's been in this this the, these two introductory paragraphs have been on your page since you you know since you started the okay. water quality section. Thank you for catching that, and we'll correct that error. Um, I don't have time to review everything with everything that's going on, so we will yeah, get no, that I'm, I, I, that, that's where that's why I asked the question because no, I appreciate it too, and we'll get that corrected. Thank you. Okay. That's all for me hey, right Joe. now. 
Okay, any other uh, public comments that uh, people would like to make? No, okay, nothing. Okay, so uh, uh, back to you, General Rogers, uh, next on uh, the agenda. I do believe our next item is emergency contract status update. Okay. Uh, our next board meeting, I will be bringing back the emergency contracts to you, um, like I said in the uh, uh, previous uh, discussion uh, that with additional damage uh, of the two lion tanks uh, and the additional piping, additional tree removal and all, uh, our expenses to date uh, are, uh, this is not including the two lion tanks. We're approaching the $1.2 million uh, response at that facility and those contracts need to be updated and need to be brought back to the board. Uh, in addition, uh, we did receive uh, funding for all categories of FEMA, A through G, I do believe. The, two ca the three categories uh, for the district that are most important are category A and B, which are emergency response and debris removal. Um, debris removal would be trees and so forth. And emergency response would be uh, getting our, our customers back in water. And then category F, which is permanent repairs uh, for public utilities. So uh, those uh, categories have been uh, funded by the uh, by the President of the United States. So that's good news for the district. That's now there great. may be some additional funding we can uh, obtain from FEMA um, and we will be looking into that. And we did have a meeting with our SDRMA, our risk management carrier, uh, district council and myself uh, and the director of operations, uh, we met with uh, our adjuster, adjusters, uh, tour damage, spent quite a few uh, hours out into the distribution system. We went over coverage um, and all the different ins and outs of, uh, of our risk management coverage. I don't know, Gina, do you want to add anything to that um, about? Um. No, I have nothing to add. I do know I can add to the whole thing with the emergency contracts. Um, I have put a bug in the ear of our engineering company that we're working with right now, Sandus Engineering. Um, they realize that the things are going really quick right now. I've had a lot of boots on the ground with this company. Uh, we've been out in the field a lot. They are very well-rounded and a good group that I'm working with. They get it. They understand what's going on out there. Um, they're definitely taking a lot of pressure off my back at this point. Um, I finally feel like I'm getting my feet under me with them taking on some of the responsibilities for me of managing some of these projects, designing these projects, getting this stuff going as I still have a whole lot of system to keep running and a lot of employees keep running out there and keep that system running with these emergency projects that are now on my table on my plate so it's been a huge help and i just hope you all understand the help they're giving me that's great glad to hear that did uh, rick you said that the fema funded uh, a number of categories was there a yeah. dollar amount associated with that uh, no, we do not have a dollar amount associated with that. Just getting the, the categories funded, uh, the dollar amounts will follow now with that. Okay. And that's they have not been out to do their... something that Sanders will be helping with. So the discretionary design And get the information for these projects and start going out to bid. We'll start getting numbers. We'll know what the final project's going to cost us. I see. Okay. So I was just curious because Stephanie had said we had about 3 million in cash when we started this whole thing. And it sounds like we burnt through 1.2 so far. Right. These are the initial response. You know, we haven't really developed, you know, I have some ballpark figures of costs that we submitted early on to FEMA. And I, my last, including uh, the lion and little lion were about 12.8 million for final costs. But we're a long ways away from that yet. Um, yeah. We still have to talk about design and, and what we're doing. Um, on the immediate response, you know, we'll probably get close to the, the $2 million on the immediate response of uh, getting people back in water. 
when the dust settles um, and maybe through the winter with operational and we may have additional damage that's developed from uh, the winter rains as well. And then I'm not sure how it works on the whole reimbursement from FEMA and stuff, but Rick, I mean, with the temporary, once we get the temporary down, we're allowed to submit that as that project's done for the temporary part of it, right? So we should be getting reimbursement back as we're finishing these things. Well, so and once we get into the final projects, some of these projects are gonna go really quick and they're expensive, but we should be able to get them done quick, like the tank coating. You know, it's not gonna take that long and it'll be a final product. And so we should be able to submit for reimbursement right away. And so hopefully we have funding coming in as we're moving into other projects. Well, that sounds encouraging. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and Steve? Yeah. Uh, um, well, my, hang, on, hang on, Rick, we got Lou's sure. ahead of you in line. Yeah. Lou, go ahead, you have uh, your hand up. Okay, speaking of funding, I have a question for Carly. You mentioned that we're using Panorama for post-fire activities, which I think is great. Um, are we approaching that $60,000 limit that we had approved for Panorama? Do you do we need to be proactive to raise that limit? We are. So actually, the last call I had with Panorama, they're going to put together a updated scope, and we'll bring that to the board once that's available. Including everything you think we're going to need for post-fire activities? Exactly. Thank you. That'll come back when we bring back the other contracts. Okay, thank you, uh, Lou. Okay, Rick, you had a uh... yeah. My understanding is that with FEMA, it's a their portion is seventy five percent, right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Except yeah. for the category F, right, Rick? Well, the category F two, but there's the, you know it's kind of early to say it's at seventy five percent. Uh, and then there's a state share in that, and there's ways that we can petition. It's tough to get the to get the 25 percent covered as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions uh, or comments from the board? No. Okay. Uh, let's go to the uh, public here. Joe, you've got your hand up. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, has there been any progress or success with the state and federal representatives for petitioning the governor, requesting the governor and the feds for a hundred percent participation in order to relieve the 25% state and local share? Right now, low level. There's been no high level discussion as of yet. We just got the all categories approved. So that'll be our next step. I didn't hear the first thing you said, Jim. I'm, uh, uh, just Rick, just I'm low sorry. level discussion with staff. I've had discussion with uh, Bruce McPherson, but not with uh, state um, and with county staff. Uh, but we just got the, the categories A through G uh, approved. So now we can start, you know, going on to further funding on under those categories and category, because you're talking about category F, I do believe. Yeah, I, the, you know, the whole, the whole game is, you know, cause you're, cause the district is a separate entity and we've got, mm -hmm. you know, we've got represent, we've got state and federal representatives, both assembly and Senate on the state side and two congressional representatives. Um, we've, you know, we've also got a, a uh, two federal senators. The getting in their ear about the district needing 100% assistance, that ultimately, you know, that's a function of the governor making that request ultimately and the federal, our federal representatives hearing that directly as well, so that they petition FEMA and the administration who ultimately have to make that decision. And given, you know, given the magnitude of the damage in the district and the costs are rising, I heard you mention this evening another three quarters of a million for 
for the tank issue, um, the the twenty five percent having that relieved, um, that will you know that'll take a big burden off of the district and subsequently off of the you know the customers the the uh, the rate payers. Understood. Agreed. Thank you, Joe. Any other uh, public comment questions? No. Okay, let's go back to the uh, next item on the agenda. Rick? Uh, as item 8C, uh, CZU Wildfire Customer Relief. I do believe finance manager has a memo. I'll let her kick it off and we'll go to discussion. Stephanie? Uh, hello, everyone. So customer relief. So we had a lot of unique situations happening. Um, we had customers that had either leaks that were in progress that they were in the middle of fixing when they had to evacuate um, valid leaks that they came home to that they didn't have an opportunity to deal with. Uh, and then we have ones where they aren't able to substantiate the cause. Um, you know, likely scenarios will be sprinklers were left on or something else was unknowingly left on. The district does currently have a leak adjustment policy for when customers experience excessive water loss beyond their control. Um, right now, it gives you 50% above your normal usage as a credit back to your account. Um, in, you know, Rick and I talked to one of the district managers down that dealt with the Woolsey fire. Um, you know, they took an approach to where they, they made accommodations um, during this time and gave customers more than what their, their normal policy was. We're still getting back a lot of the people's readings um, to see how much extra water, you know, how many people were experiencing this. So far, we were able to get some of billing cycle two back. Um, and, and from that, we were able to identify significant amounts of usage for some of these accounts. Um, depending on what you want to consider significant is also going to be, you know, up for, up for grabs. Um, but people, we looked at people that used three or more units from what their July bills were. It was about 442 of the 3,700 accounts. Accounts using nine or more units of water than in July, it was 187 accounts. Um, when you factor this into our, what's the difference, we're looking at around 85 to $100,000 in billing cycle one alone of people that I would probably consider looking to get some sort of relief. We then still have all of our billing cycle one that we're about to get all of that data back on. My assumption is it's gonna probably be roughly the same. Um, so all in all, we're probably looking at something around $200,000 in customers that experienced higher than normal usage for, for one reason or the other. Um, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, it's involving a lot of people, you know, it's a lot of emotions involved with everything. So, you know, staff are looking to see what the board's interests are in figuring out something that's going to work, um, ideally something that's going to be able to be applied to the masses. Um, you know, some people may acknowledge that they have their sprinklers going and they're not going to request a leak adjustment. Some, you know, may, may still go ahead and, and, and do something like that. Um, so we're kind of looking to see what the board is looking to, to do in this situation. We can start to bounce some ideas around. Um, we were also discussing, I think I should be able to quantify the full system. Um, by hopefully the end of next week as we get all of the different meter readings back to where we may be able to have if we wanted to push it to a budget and finance committee a special one at the end of september um, to possibly get 
a 10-1 board discussion going on it if the board doesn't have clear direction for what they want to do tonight. Um, so we're just trying to get the conversation going. If there's any clear ideas as to how the board wants to proceed, if we could implement that tonight, great. We do have a lot of people calling and asking about this, um, or at least if we can let customers know when we plan on having answers for them. We have suspended all past due um, late fees, so no one's having to worry about paying a, a high bill. And, you know, right now, you know, they are able to delay it uh, a little bit without needing to worry about any late fees at this point. If, if I could kind of inter interject a little bit uh, into this, I have contacted two other water districts, uh, one being the Paradise uh, Irrigation District that went through very similar circumstances. And they had, it turned into be a, a, a huge problem with their customers and it turned out to be a real, uh, it was a public relations, almost a nightmare for Paradise. Um, and they just finally did a, a rollback to the same period last year um, treated all customers uh, pretty much the same and not try to come up with hybrid, you know, adjustments for this customer, that customer based on one thing or another. It took a lot of their staff time. And finally, they just did a, a large scale adjustment. Um, there was a lot of motion with their customers and, it, and it, it turned out to be a real issue for their district. Um, you know, I, I would kind of recommend that the board look at doing a, a large scale adjustment and not try to get into a leak adjustment or this or, or whatever and, and treat pretty much uh, everybody uh, uh, the same. That was just uh, what their in the inputs that I received from two other agencies that went through large scale fire. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Rick. I mean, in a situation like that, I would either take a look at and just bill everybody at whatever their monthly average is. Right. For the last two months and just say that's what your your month for uh, August is or September, whatever month we're talking about. You know, Stephanie or the front office is getting calls now. Uh, our customers would like some time, uh, some type of determination or answer from the district. Uh, we could make a decision tonight. Uh, or, you know, if you wish, we could have a, a special meeting of the finance committee to talk more in depth. I'm not sure that that's needed. Uh, it's up to the board, um, but it would be good if we could move on it uh, relatively quickly. It, it is a, a, an issue with our customers and taking yep. a lot of staff yep. time. Absolutely. I, I think this is a good opportunity for the board to show its ability to respond, you know, quickly and effectively, you know, and, and recognizing the situation that everybody's uh, facing. And if, if the office is getting calls and I have no doubt that they are getting a ton of calls, then give them something that they can say. So let's see what the other directors have to say. Lou, you got your hand up? Yes, thank you. Stephanie, I for one would like to know what suggestions you might have in this regard. I mean, e easy application and, you know, it's one of those things where some people may have opinions of, you know, if their neighbor left their sprinklers on that they shouldn't be getting a break. You know, I think if we're able to do some sort of uniform application, that's definitely the easiest There's obviously financial ramifications of that. Um, but then also at least make it into an educational aspect as well so that you know, explain why, you know, the sprinkler use, I mean, part of it, I mean, it was a ton of, of water when you run the numbers on just this billing cycle alone, you know, it was roughly somewhere around four, five million gallons of water, um, you know, over, over the, the period for what we saw as large spikes in consumption. Um, so something that's going to be universal, without a doubt, our valley went through a lot. So, if the district is able to show some some empathy and give people, you know, what their normal bill likely would have been like, you know, an application like that, I agree, is is the most easy to implement as well. My second question would be for Gina. If we do 
use some sort of um, forbearance in terms of uh, forgiveness, is there any legal ramifications around that in terms of gifting? Uh, I, I don't see a, a critical gift of public funds issue here where a policy gets applied uniformly in the wake of a uh, emergency like this. Um, you know, I, I don't think there are serious legal impediments, but it may be good to get something formal, you know, some kind of a resolution or something to document the action and the reasons for it to help, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's so that it can be justified down the road. Thank you, Gina and Stephanie. And Steve? Bob, you're next. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a this is a really uh, hard one, and I you know I can just imagine what the folks in uh, Paradise were going through because basically their town was completely destroyed, and unfortunately we didn't have that doomsday scenario here, though we had an awful lot of people that lost their homes, and in particular, um, I'm assuming that at least some of this excess water usage that you were calculating, uh, Stephanie, probably uh, came from homes that were destroyed where the, the meters basically broke and the water just started running out. Um, you know, that that's another possibility. So there's so many different scenarios here. I, I just kind of like things that are simple. Um, but I do also, along with that, need to comment on a couple other areas. I noticed in social media before the evacuation started that there was a lot of people saying, hey, leave your sprinklers on, um, you know, wetting your house down because that will protect your house. And I, I'm sure a number of people did that in the good faith um, assumption they're taking out an insurance policy basically to help protect their house. Um, we ran into a situation where it wasn't exactly clear under what authority we had until we, we passed the resolution to proactively turn water off um, that people had left running um, and made a choice to leave running uh, in order to protect their house. So in, a, in addition to Lou's questions, I have a question about, is there anything we need to do with our policy, Gina, and to be done under state law and regulations that will make anything like this happening in the future much clearer and much faster for us to respond to? Well, I'm not aware of any law or regulation that requires us to have um, a policy in advance for this kind of an event. Um, though, um, of course, that's handy. It, you know, if we have it, it makes it easier potentially to make decisions in the next circumstance like this one. Um, and of course, whatever we do here will be viewed as a type of precedent for any subsequent sure, action. Of course. But, but yeah, but I don't know I have any requirement to do that. But I think I think what I heard you say earlier is that we probably, even if we gave uh, staffs uh, sort of a direction tonight so they can start communicating to the public, we still probably need to bring something back that's formal that tidies us up a bit. And I guess my question is, do we need to bring something back that will also clarify what the district's policy is around water shutoffs in a time of a dire emergency like what we went through because we were going around and shutting off proactively shutting off sprinklers that people had left uh, left running yeah in response to that bob i do think having um, a policy related to emergency shutoff going forward would be helpful so we don't have to do like we did the past time and sort of create um, the, the documentation related to the legal basis for that um, but I see them as somewhat separate issues, you know, coming up with a policy for customer relief related to this fire and implementing some policies that may be useful for a subsequent fire. I, I think they're, I think they're separate in the sense that they don't have to be worked on at the same time, though I think we do need to recognize that uh, a, a large portion of our valley is still in, in threat of um, a wildfire going forward. So we probably don't want to wait too long. But to me, these are related in the fact that I think with better clarity up front, 
uh, for folks around what may happen even if they did turn their water, their sprinklers on and attempt to save their house, that that may not ultimately be the case if there's a determination made that we need the, the water elsewhere. Um, you know, to fight the fires that are really happening uh, as was the case on the west side of Highway 9. So um, I, I wouldn't want this to be, uh, I wouldn't want a long period of time to go between a resolution around dealing with this extraordinary circumstance and um, getting a better policy in place around an emergency. Yeah, I, Bob, I think in the in the uh, agenda minutes, the staff made recommend or made reference to the fact that this this could be a teaching moment for the public as well, with respect specifically to that leaving sprinklers running, uh, anything else that they think they're doing to protect their home, but you know, in fact, isn't really benefiting everybody. So, well, they're I, never going to look. I, I see it as an opportunity where we could get some mileage out of this through social media and through our website and through producing some, you know, public, uh, public awareness material. Right. It, it's very possible. I, I don't necessarily like the, the term teaching moment because I think our subscribers are well aware of the decisions that they made in, in the moment of what they were trying to accomplish. I think it is a opportunity for us to clarify what the district may do in a dire emergency in order to protect more of the system as opposed to an as opposed to the water going to your individual house and i think that clarity is absolutely essential for our our customers so that they know what may happen so if in the future they do decide to leave their sprinklers on and some number of people are going to do that regardless of what we may say on our website that at least there's something that's very clear in place of what may happen uh, around that. And at that point in time, I think that also would have uh, implications for how future water usage may be handled as well. Right. So an opportunity to educate. Thank you, Bob. Lois, you have your yeah. hand up. And then Rick, yeah. I'll come to Clarify. you after yeah. Lois. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, am I up? Yeah. Okay. Uh, while I sympathize with people who left their sprinklers on uh, to try to protect their homes, I really believe we need some education here because if there's a rip roaring fire, sprinklers on the roof is not gonna protect anybody's home. A tree goes down, crashes through the roof, it's on fire. It's not gonna, it, it, it isn't gonna work. And I don't, I kind of agree with what you were saying, Steve, um, that there's some education needed here. People have to, people sometimes don't get what a forest fire is like and how it's just gonna go through and burn everything it touches. It doesn't matter how much water you're pouring on there. In fact, I saw one guy that was mentioning he spent six days uh, soaking his house and his house burned to the ground. People need better education um, and it's not helpful for them to be turning water on on their roofs um, if if it isn't really gonna save the house. I, I get where they're coming from. I'm, I'm not criticizing them. They just need to understand. And I'm, I'm basically here for um, just giving a general discount or, or make it as easy as possible on staff. We have staff that are working every single day and I, I want this to be a, t a teaching moment, so to speak. I'm sorry, Bob, you aren't gonna like that. Um, but people have got to understand that this was a problem for the district with all the water that was being rained on roofs and houses went down anyway. That's all. 
Thank you, uh, Lois. Uh, Rick Moran, yes. you are, it is your turn in the queue. Is, right. Do you not have a, a raise hand button on your computer? No, I do not. All right, but I have a hand. Okay. Thank you for noticing that. You're up, right. you're up buddy. So um, I, I agree that the, there's some education that needs to happen here. And one of the things that I heard is we can learn from what happened in paradise. So let's do that first and learn that if we try to get money out of people that are suffering a lot for water that's been spilt down the dam here, all right, we're, we're not doing anything for the community relations that we want to, that we've shown compassion for throughout this whole thing. So I think we should learn from what happened up in paradise, accept their uh, recommendations that as Rick spoke about and used as well, Steve, all right? And I think later on, we can come and talk more about the educational aspects about leaving water on and things like that. But the, the people in our valley will share their burden of the cost of this, and they need to put as much of this behind them as possible, and a water bill should not be something that uh, adds to their stress. Thank you, Rick. Yep. Okay, uh, Bob, you are uh, got another follow-up question or comment? Yeah, I, I think the um, the thing that people do see is that, that fire can be um, regrettably arbitrary, sometimes to the benefit of the homeowner, and that we even have the situation, you know, in this fire where, you know, homes on one side of the street were, were burned, um, homes next door to each other were burned, and a home wasn't right next door. Um, it's just, it sometimes it's just unbelievably fickle. Um, and you also hear the anecdotal stories about how people who have left sprinklers on their roof have been able to save their house for, for one reason or another. So I don't, I don't know that we're, um, that, a, that a goal of trying to, um, you know, sort of instruct folks on, on what to do is necessarily the best way to do it. But we're all adults. We can make our own decisions about what we want to do. I think, though, it is very important for us to clarify what we will do, what our actions will be as a district through a policy in these kinds of dire emergencies so that there is no question about that relative to people's understandings of if they take action A, here's what we will take if necessary to do so. That's my only point. Uh, and I don't think, again, this is anything other than a clarification of what is necessary at a district level to do in order to fight fire when it when it visits our area. Okay, thank you, Bob. Let's go to the public. We have, uh, do any of the uh, participants, attendees, have any questions or comments to share on this topic? Gail Mahood. Right ahead, Gail. Gail, you're up. Um, I just wanted to have a clarification from Stephanie about when she was talking about sort of averaging over several months. Um, would that also be for the people who were good citizens and turned their water off? <laughs> and who actually, because they were gone for two weeks, would have a lower bill and also came back to find their garden uh, dead. Uh, so I, I, I'm just a little worried that we might have an issue um, if we just say everybody gets their average bill, um, that those people may be grumbling. Yeah, so Ste I'll speak for Stephanie. She was proposing something simple that would be easy to administer she wasn't being specifically recommending one uh, particular uh, method over another. She was just highlighting the fact that she wanted to have something that would be simple, easy to explain to people when they called in, and um, and and fair. There's with anything that you decide on, there's going to be you know winners and losers to some extent, and somebody might get a little advantage, but uh, by and large, to minimize the stress on both the district staff and on the public that's calling in. Uh, she was advocating for a global solution, if you will, a simplified global, global solution. So whether that takes into consideration individual bills or not um, for people, we'll see. We'll see if the board ends up recommending anything tonight. Okay. 
Thank you. Tina, too. You're next up. Hi. Uh, I wanted to mention that my water was actually used by the firefighters. So, and then I and my home was saved, and I'm very grateful for that. But um, I, I can't account for the excess in my water bill other than maybe that was the case. Um, but I still, I understand where the staff is coming from. And I would, even though my water bill is higher, I would be willing to accept, uh, and we've already paid the higher bill um, because I think that uh, it would be valuable for the staff to have an easy solution to explain to the public. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, some people will just be willing to accept that that this was an emergency and and there will be winners and losers. And I can sympathize with um, the field as well because we were considering turning off our water, but the recommendation was to leave it on in case like firefighting staff needed to use it. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to say that, make that comment that that even though I'm one of the losers, I agree that that there should be a simpler solution so that everybody can be on the same page and just understand. My only my only caveat to that is if someone has completely lost their home, um, you may want to have a different solution to that. Um, and I don't know how you would go about doing that other than checking the assessment map and um, and and discussing that with the uh, the homeowner. So that that was all my piece. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Tina. Any other uh, comments or thoughts uh, from the public? Okay, okay, back to the, uh, back to the board. Okay. Um, well, Lois must be tap dancing because I see her all over my screen. So, yeah, I don't know. You've got control of the system, Lois. Okay, so, you know, I, I don't know what the, how the rest of you feel, but I'd like to go ahead and, and discuss making a motion right now that uh, that the district and the staff can use going forward. And I'd like to suggest something along the lines of, of uh, you know, changing, modifying everybody's bill to be the average of the last two or three months, whatever that is, and changing all the bills are um, uniformly to reflect something like that. Any other thoughts on that? Bob? Could we make it just their July bill, the same amount as their July bill? I, I would actually recommend what brought, it would be a lot easier for me to be able to take and reverse out whatever this high bill is for them. Cause you know, some, some people will have it on this one. Some people will have it on their next one. Right. Um, and, and just make it be July and August are very similar consumption months to just yes. make it be the same as their July. Um, I do agree, though, with the exception that, I mean, the people that were gone and did use less, um, you know, I think theirs should remain the same. But anyone that had usage over their prior July bill just gets simply reset back to what their July consumption was. I have a comment on that. Wouldn't it be better to go back to what their August bill was last year instead of just taking July this year? we're going to run into a lot of problems with, I mean, we have high turnover of homes. So gotcha. there's going to be a yeah. lot of people that don't, yeah, that aren't going to be apples for apples. No, that makes I just sense. want the KISS principle. Keep it simple. Yeah. yeah. We want to keep it very simple so we can explain it to our customers. Yep. Right. right. You know, we don't want to complicate it. And it sounds like Stephanie's got a, a, a good plan that she feels comfortable in implementing. I think that's the way we should go. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Uh, okay. So I don't see anybody else, uh, Director. So if, if I, I'm just wondering procedurally here, do we need to make a motion or does Stephanie have direction or? Uh, I think we need to make a motion. I, I, I think we're going to need, council's going to want us to have a motion. Okay. Yes. So Steve, could you uh, verbalize that motion and I'll second it. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. So I'll propose a motion that we uh, effectively change everybody's August billing to reflect their July billing, unless 
their August billing is less than their July bill, then they would get the, uh, the lower of the two. That's the motion. I will second that motion. Thank you very much. Okay, Holly, would you like to record the vote for this momentous uh, opportunity? Director Moran? Steve, Steve, before we do that, sorry, one question. Uh, yeah, what? Sorry, sorry, Holly, but before we do that, do we need to address the people that have lost their homes in this motion as well? Or is that already handled? I, I think we would, I, I think we should, I, I don't know. I think we should do this well, right now. Isn't I, that, I, isn't that already addressed in the stopping of connection fee and everything for those homes already? Uh, if it is, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that they were already addressed. Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is something in, implemented already for that. Sort of, but yes, the, the district has taken care of the people that have had their homes their homes destroyed. Um, the motion on hand will be for any people that have active accounts. Uh, great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Holly. Back to, or back to you, Holly. Okay, Director Moran. Yes. Director Henry. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Ferris. Aye. President Swan. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Holly. Okay, Rick, back to you. Uh, new business uh, item uh, 9A, uh, surplus district property, uh, resolution number 320-21. Uh, I'll ask district council to uh, present this item to the board. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'm just flipping between screens. Um, so um, this item is one that's coming back to the board um, after prior consideration. It actually has three different pieces to it. Um, I guess I'll start with the policy itself. Um, what you have presented here tonight is uh, a policy for the disposal of surplus real property. Um, this was previously presented to the board for discussion on July 16th. Um, and at that time, the plan was to bring this policy um, back to the board for approval along with kind of a package providing for um, disposition or identifying various um, parcels for surplusing and putting them in kind of the buckets. Um, for disposal under the policy. Um, I don't at this time have all of the um, various properties uh, detailed out in a resolution for purposes of, of you know, putting them in the buckets under the, the uh, policy, but would like to move forward with the policy itself um, because that will help with the disposition of the Manana Woods well site. So now I'm getting to kind of part two of this item. Um, the Manana Woods well site at uh, Zero Kings Village Road in Scotts Valley um, was previously uh, designated as surplus by a resolution of the board back in March. Um, and the reason this is coming back to you for redesignation is that it appears that um, the property can be sold um, in a way that's mutually beneficial uh, between the district and Scotts Valley uh, Water District, and that qualifies it for exempt surplus treatment under the policy that, that we've proposed, um, and it would streamline the disposition process for that, that parcel um, because it would allow, if this parcel gets redesignated as exempt surplus, the district could um, negotiate directly with Scotts Valley without going through um, a process of offering it to other public agencies and, and housing developers and so on. Um, so that's the second part of the item that's in front of you. The third part is that we're recommending that the board appoint um, me to serve as a co-negotiator with the district manager um, in connection with a possible sale of the Manana Woods well site to the Scotts Valley Water District. Um, and you'll see the resolution that's proposed is attached to uh, the agenda item. It's resolution number three, 2021. 
Um, it addresses the reasons for the policy and the redesignation of the Mariana Woods well site. Um, and then it attaches as an exhibit the policy that was previously presented to the board. Um, so if you approve, if you adopt, choose to adopt the motion, um, it'll approve the policy and redesignate the Mariana Woods site. And then I would request if the board agrees with the recommendation, a separate motion to appoint me as a co-negotiator with the district manager for the disposition of that parcel. Would those be two different numbers then? Uh, well, the resolution will, will take care of the policy and the redesignation. And then I would just request a motion, uh, no number, just a motion. Okay. To designate me as a co-negotiator. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, can I make a motion that we approve well, resolution 320-21? Lois, hang on. We, we have uh, the opportunity for discussion amongst the board. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then we got to let the public uh, comment as well. All so. right. Sorry. No, no problem. Got carried away. I want to. I want to wrap this thing up too. So, do we have any uh, comments or questions from any of the board for uh, for Gina or Rick or uh, anybody or Lois since she's on camera? I am. Yeah, you are. You're occupying my full screen right now, Lois. I'm sorry. I'm just lucky, I guess. <laughs> No questions from anybody on the board that I see. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just make a statement here. Um, I agree that we should try to sell this to uh, our neighbor water district, uh, San Lorenzo Valley, uh, Scotts Valley, excuse me. And uh, we share interest with them in the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. And we should uh, work together as much as we can in a mutually agreeable and maybe profitable way for us. Thanks for your input. Okay, uh, Bob, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I, I agree with what Rick says. And then typically in any kind of uh, deal like this, there's value for both parties. And I believe that, you know, the parcel that we have has value for both parties. And hopefully this will all work out right. I think Gina and Rick have done a great job in putting this together. And so I'm looking forward to uh, moving this along. Thank you, Bob. And uh, any other comments from any director? Member of the board? No? To the public, do we have any thoughts or comments or questions for anybody on this issue? I literally hear crickets. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. My backyard. Oh, come back to the panel. They're, they're jumping around your irises, Rick. Okay, so back to the panel. Okay, and uh, let's see. I believe, uh, uh, Lois, you were in the process of wanting to make a motion. Please go ahead. Okay, I would like to make an, a motion to approve um, 3 20 21 as stated by. Our attorney. I'll second. Okay, I'll second that, Lois. Okay, it's been seconded. Uh, Holly, would you record a vote on this motion? Director Moran. Yes. Director Henry. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Ferris. You're muted. Aye. President Swan. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Holly. And now uh, we'd like to go ahead and make a motion. I'll make the motion that uh, that council be uh, appointed co-negotiator along with the district manager. I'll second that. Thank you. Holly, would you like to record that vote? Director Moran. Yes. Director Henry. Yes. Director Fulls? Yes. Director Ferris? Aye. President Swan? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much, Holly. And now we come to the uh, 
Item 10 on the agenda, the consent agenda. And uh, unless somebody wants something pulled out from the consent agenda, we'll move along to district reports. And if anybody has any, um, um, Rick? Steve? Yep. Steve. Bob? Oh, I sorry, Bob, I didn't see your, your hand up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't have anything to pull out, but I wanted to give Holly some real big props here. You know, in the middle of all this evacuation, and taking care of her husband who was seriously injured and all of that. And she still got all of these out in uh, what I think is a record period of time. So Holly, thank you very much for, for doing that. Great service to uh, the community. Well put, Bob. Holly, you've done a great job. Thank you very much for all of your efforts and all of us. And uh, moving along to district reports, is there anybody have a district report they want to uh, share, environmental, finance, or legal? And I see no hands. Okay, director's reports, director's communication, future board of directors meeting agenda items, anything there? No, no, nothing? Okay. Written communication, I guess there was something from Phillips dated in there. Informational material, rebuild Santa Clara Sentinel. Okay, uh, if you guys don't have anything else you want to bring up, then I'm going to call this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your participation, and we'll yeah. look to seeing you next, uh, next I, month. I do, as a director of operations, apologize for not having a director's report ready for operations or engineering. I just want to say that, you know, I'm a lot on my table right now. I will get you guys an update, and I'll get your report on the next board meeting. James, from my perspective, you already gave me a report earlier. Thank you for yep, that. No worries, James. Yeah. Thank you. We'll all buy you a beer, too. And everybody else on the staff. Hey, Joe's back open. Is it? Great. Yep. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for your participation. We'll talk to you all later. Have a good week.